doubt that the people will join us as and when they come. As I was saying to some of the guys that joined us a bit earlier, I did a webinar last month and um, we had a guy who joined us just at the hour mark when we're coming to the end. And uh, most frustratingly, he tried for an entire hour to try and get hold of us and then um, uh, it took him that long. So I understand that it is quite complex and some people um, will take a while and obviously some systems don't allow it at all. Anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work it out, I don't doubt. Okay, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to mute you guys so that we don't get any feedback. And I, w I will bring you in um, later on uh, when, we, when we get onto the chat phase so that um, you can add your elements to it. But welcome to the uh, What is a Coaching Culture program. This is sort of the first if I'm running a series of monthly workshops on coaching cultures. What I have discovered is that um, there is a significant growth of interest in coaching cultures in the last three or four months. I don't know whether that's because I've been more active in it or whether there's a growth in it. I'm not sure what that is, but it's definitely happening. And uh, what's interesting is, as I sort of predicted, um, clients have invested money in training, coach training, um, possibly uh, some senior level coaching awareness, uh, coach pools, internal coach pool development, things like that. And yet they're still not reporting uh, any form of coaching culture. Um, and the concern is, what, where do they invest next? What do they do next? And um, this is a, a sort of major concern for a lot of organizations. How do they develop their coaching culture next? So what the series of webinars are about is, is to introduce to all the areas of the coaching culture, um, what they are, and bring in experts if possible. I've, I've already spoken to a few this morning who I'm going to bring in on these webinars who are experts in specific things like developing internal coach pools, workforce coachability, uh, and coach training. So there's lots of exciting things going on and hopefully it'll be a benefit for people to understand a little bit more about what uh, what a coaching culture actually is and what it entails. So the idea today is that um, I want to, I'm going to just sort of do a little bit of an introduction for you just to sort of wet, the, uh, wet your appetite. There's a few things I'm going to show you, there's a few amusing things and a few not so amusing things. Um, but after each slide what we're going to do is we'll just sort of talk through what we our reflections on on that and our thoughts about um, what actually is a coaching culture. Ultimately, at the end, and I appreciate we'll all have different understandings of what a coaching culture is. We had a client two years ago who <laughs> they believed a coaching culture was the a co a coaching session was the hour you spend uh, after a sales meeting feeding back what happened in that sales meeting. That to them was a coaching conversation. So a coaching culture was all surrounding around that whole hour piece after sales meeting. Um, and they weren't for changing. That was for them, that was what coaching was. So I appreciate that for a lot of organizations, coaching can be different, and therefore, a coaching culture too can be different. Um, so I want to expose you now to some examples of different coaching cultures and different theories, and um, then hopefully at the end we'll have a chat about it, and um, I want to come up with some theories that you've got about what you think coaching culture is. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, if I can make the technology work, there we go. Now, Carol, this uh, slide is a series of pictures which I've taken off um, the internet. I typed in Google Coaching Culture into Google, thinking I'm going to get some wonderful images that are going to help me understand this, um, and didn't get any. Uh, and in fact, the six images on the um, on the uh, uh, screen here are three of which actually don't contain any real people at all. Um, they're just sort of groups of um, drawn pictures. And then we've got uh, sort of what I would call three stock images of um, uh, various pictures of people cheering and clapping and things like that. But I think what the point uh, uh, they come across here, I mean, I like number one, which is a, it's a drawing, but it's of an arrow, of a number of people holding up an arrow with one person standing on it pointing. Um, all very dictatorial, I think, not very coaching culture-ish. Um, but I think what this does do is it sends us a very clear message that actually people don't know what a coaching culture is. Um, and I was surprised in the coaching culture images section in Google how many infographs there were and, and such things like that, you know, diagrams, pictures, theories, and all those sorts of things. And it seems that actually the reality is we don't know. We don't know what a coaching culture is. Um, and uh, this is causing a major problem in terms of developing our coaching cultures later on. So why is it important to know what a coaching culture is? Well, in order to grow our coaching culture, we need to know three things. So, uh, you know, let's imagine your organization, 
is looking to grow its coaching culture. We've done some work before, and that's gone well, but it's not delivered an amazing result in terms of coaching culture. So where do we go now? What do we focus on? There are three questions you need to ask yourself at this point. Um, what does success look like in terms of a coaching culture? How do we measure it? Um, that's the subject of another webinar. Where are we now? So what have we done? How is that counting towards the organization? So what's our current status? Um, and we cover that through our Embark Coaching Culture Diagnostic. And then, of course, finally, which is why we're all here today, what is the coaching culture for our, our organization? So I'm hoping that in the time we spend uh, now, we're going to look at that third point, which is what does the coaching culture mean for our organization to help us move forward and grow it, um, grow it to the next level? Um, let me just unmute you all there and just ask any observations, particularly on those, um, so you're all unmuted now, you can speak if you wish. Um, the, uh, the pictures, uh, what does anyone think of the man on the arrow pointing and going forwards? Silence, maybe, maybe nobody's thought anything of it at all. Okay, in which case, um, in terms of these three ideas of growing your coaching culture, um, what does success look like? Where are we now? And what, um, what is the coaching culture for our organization? Does anyone think there's anything missing from that before we move on? Richard? Um, so, um, no, I think that, that kind of covers the, the questions that I would expect it to. I suppose there's, for me, there's always an expectation that you'd need to answer in terms of um, how long it, it may take to get there. Yeah. So, I mean, cultural change for me, obviously, is, a, is kind of, it's huge for one, um, and uh, secondly, it would, it would take an awful long time. And I think depending on uh, the answers to actually all three of those questions, um, you're probably going to have sort of different time scales in your mind. I know that we went when we started um, our um, journey for coaching culture, we probably thought it would be quicker. Uh, yeah. than, than it's turning out to be. And actually, for as much of the, the kind of good progress we've had, it, it's almost like the the end point is it's movable. You know, we get Indeed. to the line and we've made some success, and then you, you think, well, actually, with this, this further, we can kick on. Absolutely. How many people in the organization? Uh, it's 2,500 thereabouts. Okay. So you're looking at at least four years, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, we're um, in year three now. <laughs> right. Okay. And and you know, if 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 you have four hundred, you might do it in two years. But the it, it very much depends on the number of people, but also how you target and implement it. Um, and you're right. Even when you get to that four years or whatever it is, they'll all, they, with coaching, there's always something more you can do. That's the beauty of it. The self-sustaining coaching culture um, can always be topped up and improved. Um, who else can we pull in here? Has anybody else got any views on that? Carol, maybe? Um, I think for me, I, I mean, I think the questions are key, and I thought it was interesting um, where you, you talked about the sales um, organisation where, you know, just yes. for them, a conversation after a sales meeting was their co co coaching culture. Yes. Um, so I think that's key. Um, for me, it's 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 almost like it's not just the skills; it's about an attitude as well. Um, and we'll come on to that. For I, everybody. I, yes. What you find is there are a lot of models and theories about coaching cultures, and they're all skills based. Um, or not, you know, and there's a feelings element to this. In fact, we were um, I was at a meeting the other day, and uh, um, there was a piece about what what do what do conversations or what do coaching conversations look, sound, and feel like. Um, and I think a lot of the time that feel piece gets missed um, in terms of how to move it forward. Okay, right, I noticed Ian uh, Shepherd has joined us. Hello, Ian, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. My apologies for being being late. <coughs> That's okay. Well, we just, um, I've just muted everyone except you there, Ian, because I was saying what we do is between the slides, I mute everyone because there's quite a bit of background noise and it can get confusing. And then so I'll introduce a few things, and then we'll all come in and have a chat, and then and then move on. Okay? Yeah, fine. Good. All right. Well, I shall uh, mute you then, and uh, and we'll move on. Um, 
Uh, Michaela does have a question, uh, and this is a very good question, in fact, and I'm going to uh, bring Richard back on, because Michaela says, what would the end point look like? We talked about your poetry culture being four years or whatever it might be, and then you said when we get there, we're going to move on further. What, uh, her question is, what does an end point look like? Well, I, I, can, I can answer that question partially, I think. So we, uh, uh, well, part of the answer is, I don't think we really know. Uh, the yeah. other part of the answer is we have um, a set of central principles in our organization. I know obviously a lot of organizations do. One of our principles is that um, people should be able to solve problems at their own level. Um, and actually one of the things that led us to, to look into developing a, a coaching culture was the fact that we felt that the organizational structure was um, compressed in some way that actually a lot of people spent a lot of time making decisions through the management structure that were decisions that really we wanted their direct reports to be making. Uh, and actually sort of decompressing that structure, we needed a vehicle for that. And coaching was seen as one of those ways to encourage people to, to sort of make the decisions that are, are at their level. So in answer to the question, I guess at the point at which everybody's operating at uh, a, a kind of a stage in the organization where we feel is right. How you measure that, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, again, measuring it too, is, 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 that's a matter for another webinar. Um, and I have yet to meet an organization that can successfully or, or feels, feels that they have a way of successfully measuring the coach club. There are ways. Um, and I know I've seen um, evidence of Ernst and Young having a very detailed approach to measuring a coaching culture, but actually, ultimately, that didn't work. So even when those people have tried, there are risks involved in inherent with that. Um, good question. Thank you, Michaela, and thank you for your answer, Richard. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so really what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a series of um, – uh, Michaela's just come back on you there, Richard, saying um, – I think you know how to determine the measurements at the beginning. Otherwise, how do you know where you're going? Yeah, and we'll, that's something else that um, we'll come on to uh, in a little bit. Um, thank you, Michaela. Um, so, I really, I just want to go through a number of de definitions that I've seen, I've come across, I, I liked and didn't like, um, and then we can talk about how they may influence or affect um, the way we decide what our coaching culture is. Um, Amanda Booth Consulting produced, I don't know Amanda, um, Produced the ten elements of a key elements of coaching culture um, uh, blog piece about three or four weeks ago, um, and in it you, you can see her ten key points, and, and I don't need to read them out. Carol, um, I know you can't see the slide. There's nothing in here you wouldn't expect. Uh, what I will say is that it's it's a very um, process-driven solution to a coaching culture. Take a systemic approach. Choose an adequate level of penetration. Involve top management things like that. And um, what I find is this is sort of very consistent with the way people try and approach their coaching culture. And then they often miss the point, which is, as somebody's made earlier, is the it, there's a big feeling piece in there. There's a big um, sort of uh, an, an attitudinal piece in there rather than skills. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll come on to that a bit longer. So I think that this is a definition I think is great for a blog or something like that. People will read it. But in reality, practically trying to apply it to an organization, um, it doesn't work. So then moving on to another fairly recent definition that came out of the a company called Partnership Potential. Um, this was uh, in a blog a few weeks ago as well. Three steps to an internal coaching culture. One, establish the organizational why. Well, we sort of touched on that a little bit with um, uh, with the uh, setting what the success criteria look like. So why are we doing it? What do we want to change? And um, decisions to be taken in terms of how do we move that forward and then find your champion. Uh, I, I think there's three uh, steps. I think they're valid. I think there's plenty more. I think this misses an awful lot. And again, going back to the definitions of the coaching culture, um, a lot in there is, is missed. And I see a lot of people trying to define coaching culture in such a small, loose way. They don't actually cover the whole picture. So uh, again, I think another area of, um, of where perhaps it's gone slightly wrong. I couldn't resist giving you um, Meganson's uh, definition of a coaching culture because I think although he's, he's captured it very well, um, it does say what it does exactly what it does on the tin. Um, 
it's very academic speak and, and Carol, for your benefit, I'm, I'm more than happily read this out should I have, if I've got enough breath in me. So, a coaching culture exists in an organisation when a coaching approach is a key aspect of how the leaders, managers and staff engage and develop all their people and engage their stakeholders in ways that create increased individual, team and organisational performance and shared value for all stakeholders. Now, I'm going to bring you all back in here because I'm going to fascinate you to <laughs> what you think of this. So, I'm just bringing the microphones back on. Um, Sam, uh, what do you think of uh, Megginson's idea of a coaching culture? Uh, just trying to digest it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I struggle to read it, I have to be fair. I think, you know, you sort of lose the thread, don't you, as you're going on for it. Ian? Yeah. I, yeah. I was just going to say, there's one key thing for me about the engagement with, with stakeholders and, and just kind of involving people that I think is a, a key element um, that he's highlighting there. I find that yeah. quite interesting because I think sometimes people can often just sit in their own little bubbles and actually with a coaching coach you are looking out and wider and beyond just where you are and trying to, to involve others. So yeah, I think there's quite a point there. Yeah, he's got a clear message, hasn't he, about um, management leadership. I mean, and Michaela's also made a very good point here. Isn't it easier, often easier, to determine what a coaching culture isn't? And I'm going to write that down because that's got. Um, I like that. Uh, we can all we all know what a coaching culture isn't. Um, Ian, I was going to bring you in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> again, I apologise for being being late because I've probably missed right. some important some important things. I guess uh, I'm looking at this from, from the viewpoint of what kind of culture am I looking for in my organization and how can I use coaching as a tool uh, methodology to help me develop that. And I think it's important to be clear about the kind of culture you're looking for, what, uh, what aspects of it, um, things around do we want a, a culture that has a very um, <clears throat> where there's a lot of teamwork and collaboration, where there's continuous improvement and innovation. Um, it's looking to looking to have customer responsiveness, and you, you can go on. I've got about 30 indicators around sort of culture and what it looks like, and it's sort of saying, well, how can we use how can we use coaching as a way to uh, to bring about the kind of culture that will support our organisation to achieve its strategic objectives. Um, I guess that's a no D way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, I don't know quite how that fits in with the, the discussion that you, you're currently well, having. It, yeah, right now, perhaps not, but I think, you know, those indicators that you assess against your coaching culture, I think there's another webinar waiting for those. And if you would, um, I don't know, at a later date, be happy to share some or all of those for us, I think there'd be a lot of value in that. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I appreciate I, that you may not, so, but uh, well, that would be helpful. Perhaps understanding exactly what you mean by a coaching culture and how that's different from sort of the existing culture in the organisation that you're trying to influence. That's yes. I find that quite helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll come on a little bit more to some other definitions and then I think what we'll do is once we've got to the end of that, we'll come up and we'll just literally start sort of talking about what we think it is. And if we can, we'll try and generate some sort of definition if we haven't found one that, uh, that suits us now. Um, Michaela's just come back to that I would summarise the coaching culture as uh, more asking, less telling. Um, yeah, that's sort of more getting in the right direction, I agree. Um, there are issues there that Ian might have about meeting his um, set sort of criteria against that remit. But in terms of more attitudinal, I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think um, we, can, uh, we can move on. Um, so, just going to mute those again. There probably is a mute all button somewhere, but I've not found it. Um, so just a couple more definitions. I, you know, I know this is, uh, I didn't want to preach to you. I just wanted to take stuff that I'd seen and present it to you in a way that, you know, people, that, stuff that I've been involved in so that we can then it allow us to work it through. Um, so from, uh, from an organization called Change Board, we have three uh, key elements of the coaching culture, responsibility, self-belief, and blame-free. Now, I think what I like about this as a definition is we're moving much more into the attitudinal pieces of the message. We've gone away from sort of skills and an academic description of what it is, um, you know, because we can all state that a coaching culture is a place where coaching conversations happen. That anyone can say that. But then, you know, what does that look, sound, and feel like? Look, sound, and feel like. 
And I think the idea of people taking responsibility, that's a key part of any coaching culture, without a doubt. Um, I think self-belief, which is their second one, very strong. I think you know, people need to have a self-belief about themselves to be good coaches. It's no good. Uh, if you're not a good coach, you can't necessarily um, be good at uh, uh, delivering self-belief. So, sorry, uh, what am I saying? If you're good with self-belief, you'll be a much better coach. And I think that's a really important point there. And finally, blame-free. I mean, blame-free is quite specific. You could put a whole bunch of things. You could talk about prejudice, trust. Uh, all those sorts of things within that bracket. So I think it's a bit specific, but again, I like the tonality of it and the way that um, that moves forward. So um, the next one I want to give you, this is one I heard from somebody, I'm afraid I don't know, I can't remember who it was, but um, it was a bit of a stroke of genius for me in terms of what a coaching culture is. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'll open up the page and then um, we'll have a chat about that. I'm just going to unmute you all now, so you should start doing some background noise coming back in. And um, have, we'll have a look at this as a definition um, for coaching cultures. So, Carol, for your benefit, it says, a coaching culture is an environment in which every conversation has only one person's agenda at its heart. What do you think of that, Carol? Sorry, can you say that again, Tim, an environment where? Yeah. An environment in which every conversation has only one person's agenda at its heart. Oh, that would be nice. I've <laughs> put you on the spot there, haven't I? Um, anybody yeah. else? <laughs> Is there anyone that hasn't spoken yet? If there is, they're keeping quiet. <laughs> well, yes, a little bit. Um, Michaela said, I would understand that in... That's all right. I would understand that in that... Uh, the coach has had the lead, the conversation, and not the coach. But I would potentially think around that, around that in the workplace. So the organisation has to benefit too. I think that's a very valid point. Um, and I think that uh, it, it, this this is a good theoretical idea of, of what a um, coach culture is. But is it realistically deliverable in an organisation? And I think that's a, that in itself is a very good point. Um, and ultimately, as Michaela says, again, the organisation has the ultimate agenda. Um, you could argue that's not actually in coaching um, theme, if you like, but at the end of the day, coaching has to exist in an organisation which is looking to make money, cut costs, increase revenue, etc., etc. So I think this is a very purist approach, but I think there's value in it because uh, every, coach, every conversation which has one person's agenda at heart is a good coaching conversation. Therefore, a good coaching culture should have every co uh, a conversation like that. Practical in a, in a work environment, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it no. would work. You, well, you wouldn't, uh, what you wouldn't be able to do, and, and, and when I show you the next definition, um, is you wouldn't be able to take that to the board, would you? They would laugh at you. Um, um, but I think in terms of, of an L&D professional trying to understand their coaching culture, there's, there's a piece in here which makes sense. Um, and it needs to be translated to the organisation. Okay, so uh, well, that one's a, a little bit light-hearted. And the final one, this is really the unlimited central version um, of what a coaching culture is, and it's a, it's a little bit more detailed because it's the one I'm most familiar with. But it's a, essentially an environment in which inspiring leaders have amazing conversations that generate great results. Um, now, we break that down a bit because the, the, that as a, as a description sounds a little bit glib. You know, what is an inspiring leader? What is amazing conversations? But if we break that down, it actually starts to get uh, quite interesting. So, you know, what are the qualities of inspiring leaders and do we have them in our organization? Um, do these, for instance, uh, these qualities of inspiring leaders who meet in with any of Ian's competencies that he mentioned? Um, I'm sure some of them, some of them may, some of them twisted slightly might well do. Um, but in, in terms of generating inspiring, we started to got some ways in which we can measure, develop, and grow those leaders to become uh, more inspiring if they're not already. I, I don't know how many of you have got a huge number of inspiring leaders. If you have, I'd like to meet them because um, <laughs> they are few and far between. Um, and then if we break down as well amazing conversations, um, that actually, it, to, for me, the coaching culture is all about the conversation. Um, so what amazing conversations happen when, and uh, I'm just muting you all again, just a little background uh, noise there. Um, a coaching culture is all about the conversations between individuals. So it's all about quality and quantity of questioning, 
it's all about very high quality listening skills to improve respect, deep understanding. So that's all about um, uh, um, not lack of prejudice, uh, and trust, all those sorts of things, which come out in our conversation. Um, improved attention, uh, it's great to attention through improved observational skills, so looking at body language and recognizing signs within individuals and people. And then finally, um, giving credible and good feedback, which is uh, definitely part of the coaching culture as far as we're concerned. So in terms of your amazing conversations, these are some of the, the areas that we'd be looking to develop, grow, show change, and actually de um, uh, develop a good, if you like, uh, coaching culture um, initiatives to move forward. And then finally, great results, which you can't, if you can't measure the success of a coaching culture, you mentioned this earlier, um, we talked about it, Richard, and um, what does success look like? Well, it, in our view, there are um, five key real measurements of great results. Uh, meeting targets for improved performance, uh, enhancing and supporting organizational values to give greater engagement, um, increasing morale um, for workforce engagement. Workforce engagement has been a big issue over the last three years, and uh, it's certainly been proved that a good coaching culture will deliver that. Um, Resilience, again, last year was a big thing. We're into mindfulness now, but resilience was a big thing last year in it, in that people being able to cope with regular change. Uh, and then finally, greater capacity to deliver more for less, which I think is a key requirement of any employer or employee, well, any employer out there trying to deliver uh, high quality um, and sort of profit-led uh, organizational development. So in terms of that, that's really um, our more detailed definition. Having given you those, I didn't really want, I didn't want to preach at you and do a lecture you, if you like, about coaching cultures. I just wanted to give you some stuff that was out there that we might be able to use. What I wanted to do now was, um, having given you them, is to say, what did you like, what didn't you like, and um, what are you going to take away with you, and what's the most important part of that? And I'm going to collect it all here on this piece of paper here, and then use that as a definition um, for moving forward. So, Carol, let's start with you. Um, obviously, you haven't seen this. We appreciate that. But you've heard a lot. What's, yes. what's resonating in your head? What have you heard that you um, liked? Um, I liked the responsibility and the blame-free. Um, that was something I had to come along with as, as a definition. Carol, would you be happy to tell us where you're from so the other people can... Um, yeah, sure. Um, London know. Borough of Bexley. Okay, so public sector responsibility and blame-free yeah. is a... Is, you know, it's an area for development, I guess, and so that's yeah. something that resonated with you. And do you yeah. think coaching? Uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. I, I was going to say there are other parts of some of the other definitions as well. But well, what can you just, say? Well, yeah. what I was going to say was, um, essentially, do you feel? Do you think responsibility and blame free is part of the coaching culture? Do you think it's essential elements of it? Absolutely. Yeah. You do. Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, and what else resonated with you? I think that when you were getting into the detail around the amazing conversations about the quality of the conversations, I think that's essential. Yeah. Um, the, the middle definition that you, you talked about where every conversation has one person's agenda, that did kind of make me chuckle because I think of any kind of um, discussion uh, about anything people have not only the organizational agenda but they have their own agendas yeah um, which makes conversations messy so I think um, if you got anything out of that it's about if you can just get people to really listen to one another and give people the space to listen and then discuss rather than just going off with their own agendas and um, not listening to other people and then blaming when it goes wrong um, or giving up responsibility and saying well it's nothing to do with me because it was your way that kind of thing um, so yeah amazing conversations I think amazing conversations blame free and responsibility okay and do you think that if I if I was to walk into your organization today and say to somebody um, what what do you think a conversation with only one agenda to part would look and feel like? Do you think they would understand that as a concept? Sorry, I, I missed the last bit. You, you went a bit blurry. Okay, so what I'm saying is that we're talking about conversations having one agenda at heart. Do you think yeah. that's something that people would understand in your organisation? Do you think it no. would be completely alien to them? It would be completely alien. 
Right. Okay. So, and, and we'll, we'll ask some of the other people because, you know, as you chuckled about it, a few other people said a few words. I think maybe, the, you know, it, it's a concept, conceptually it's, it's good, but actually in reality it's completely rubbish. Or rubbish. It just doesn't stand up. Um, but it could form the basis of a, a if you like, a good, it, from your point of view, it helps you understand it, doesn't it? It gives you a language in which you mm. have to understand the coaching culture. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ian? I, I like the last model that you, you put up, but I think, that, yeah. as, as no doubt with everybody else, it's, there's some things that I'd, I'd want to add for it, add yeah. to it. Um, I think there's there's an aspect about um, I think there's an aspect about support and challenge in terms of, of approach, and it's it's doing the the best of both, so that you you're in a position that you can support someone fully, but you can you can you can still get them to challenge too. Um, so I think that's quite important. Um, a couple of other things with they've gone out of my head at the moment. I think that's uh, an interesting point there, Ian, because you know you're saying uh, you know one thing about coaching culture, we're not replacing the management style. You know, this is not a replacement of their management style. It's an addition to, and yeah, I think that is often right. misunderstood. We do a lot of coach training. What you find is people come along, they sit there, they fold their arms, and say, "You're not changing me." And then you're like, "Well, hang on a minute. Well, I to think what we're here to do is enhance you with some more skills that you can use when and where you see fit." And the example yeah. we use of that is, you know, the fire engine racing to the fire. You know, they, they get out the fire engine. There's a woman, woman with a baby at the window, and the smoke coming out. That's not the time for a coaching conversation. Um, you know, whereas you could go back to the station, everyone you know finished and calmed down. That's the time for the coaching conversation. And I think it's important to stress here, and you've made a very good point about your support and challenge piece. Is coaching culture actually is not a replacement culture in, in addition to? It. I think I think another aspect, which which isn't uh, maybe it's implicit. Um, there's quite a lot of useful stuff from the the positive psychology movement and positive yeah. coaching, strength strength based coaching, and and so on. Um, one of one of the more more recent things that, that hit me was how important it is to actually care about the people that you're coaching, and 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 managers having such things as compassion. Now it's a devilishly uh, difficult thing to sell, but. Um, you know, when you when you look at some of the, I don't know whether some of you may have read the book Positive Leadership by Kim Cameron. It's it's around the um, positive um, <coughs> positive um, organisation scholarship sort of uh, movement, and and there's, there are a few interesting points in there that uh, talk about the kind of organisation you want, and it's certainly certainly something that coaching could have a major influence on on bringing about. Right. So, so, so there's there's that whole whole aspect that you, you sort of learn about. It's interesting actually because I mean you you talk about um, positivity, compassion, and, and you know I, I think um, I've recently noticed a, 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 um, a trend to unconscious bias work, um, and also in appreciative inquiry. Now, for yeah, me, those where I'm. those two elements are all key parts of the coaching culture. They're almost the few, they're subset of a coaching culture. Um, you know, some organisations decide they're going to move down, you know, that route of appreciative inquiry or whatever. But ultimately, are they are those organisations looking for a coaching culture or not? And, and that, um, that there's some interesting stuff there. And in fact, the positive leadership book I wasn't familiar with, so I'm going to see if I can uh, um, have a look at that. That would be great. Thank you, um, Richard. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's some. I'm really interested in this whole agenda or agendaless question. So I think that if you if you accept what coaching is, then actually, well, it, you should be encouraging it to be agenda, uh, you know, not the agenda of the organisation, but it should be uh, the agenda of the of the individual. And there's a bit of a brave pill moment to take if you if a coaching culture is what you want. Um, as much as you, you sort of need to relinquish that control uh, in order that people feel sort of what truly trusted and in, invested in that you would just listen to their their agenda. You know, if they if they are if you continue to invest in them, they continue to develop themselves because of that culture. Ultimately, the the alignment 
you would assume should happen. It takes time then, as you've learned. It, it does, but it, it, I think it's really interesting that when I when I talk to leaders across our business about coaching and about particularly in a, in a purist sense, um, there's a real nervousness. You know, that well, what, what if they want to go off in a, in a completely uh, different direction? What if what if that sort of misses the point of the organisation? There's a there's a genuine concern, and I, I take your point about um, you know taking that. Uh, definition to your board, you'd probably get laughed out of the room. You would, yeah. But I, yeah, and I think um, a, a lot of a lot of the issues with coaching is that you you know organisations. I see this time and time again. Um, and in fact, uh, we did some work with British Gas over the last few weeks, and um, you know uh, they invest they've invested in the coaching in terms of training. And I'm not saying this is British Gas an example, but you know the standard companies they invest in their coach training. They perhaps set up an internal coach pool, which fun sort of functions, but not brilliantly. Um, and but they're finding that the coaching culture just isn't coming. And and often that is well, there are many reasons why that would be. But for, for a lot of organisations, that's about senior managers grasping the concept of coaching themselves, because often that can involve some personal pain um, uh, in terms of changing to do things differently. And people will revert to staying in their comfort zone if they can. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges that all of you guys face is when you sit there or stand there in front of the senior decision makers um, or try and justify yourself to anyone, that you find yourself, you don't have the words to, to get it across. And part of what I wanted to do with this session was, and these this whole idea of the coaching culture think tank is to create some form of robust way in which we can we can present it to to the board and they go yeah I get this and I can see the benefits and we need to move forward with it. Good. Um, the genderless and genderless. There's something there I can work on. Some sort of a genderless conversation or something, which could be quite an interesting uh, bit of training. Um, Sam. Yeah, I, I think the amazing conversation bit is the, the thing that really resonates with me in terms of um, quality quality questioning. Um, but I think like Michaela's highlighted in her comments that she's been putting, yeah. some of it is around you know questioning and getting the other person to you know really think about what they're saying and trying to get them to to come up with their own answers. Um, but I think in kind of a work, just thinking of a manager to the employee kind of coaching conversation and thinking, you know, you need those quality conversations to make you your um, employee feel like they've been listened to, be able to, to respond and be able to try and come up with things on their own. But I think sometimes people can go a little bit too far and never actually get to any conclusion. Um, and so sometimes people feel they're doing too much coaching in terms of just asking questions without you know, getting what they think their manager should be providing in terms of a bit of direction or um, coming in there. And I think Michaela highlights, you know, there's there's a time and a place for, for both being a bit more directive and using the coaching skills to, to draw more out of a of an individual. Yeah, um, and so. Michaela agrees there, yes. And mm -hmm. the manager can set the aim theme and the employee can set the method. Yeah. Um, I yeah. like that, actually. That's, that's good. And yeah. I think you're right. I think where the coaching culture actually succeeds or fails is in the individual conversations going on at all levels within the organisation. Um, and that's really where the focus needs to be. It's about high quality, amazing conversations. Sometimes we use the term courageous conversations. Um, and uh, as you say, the other thing is it's not, coaching doesn't necessarily have to be the, you know, one size fits all. Coaching comes in as part of a conversation. You might only need two, two coaching questions in one coaching conversation. Uh, in one managing conversation, but at least you've used them and you know the benefits and why you've used them. Um, and in fact, I was saying to somebody else, you, you, you can actually measure a successful coaching management conversation just based on the number of what would, uh, what, why, when, where, and how, versus the must, would, should, coulds, and wills. Um, you know, and if you were able to count them all up, you'd be able to tell whether you'd had a good coaching conversation or a good uh, dictatorship type of conversation um, in its loosest terms. Um, okay, has anybody else, has anybody not contributed to that? Some interesting stuff there. Anybody want anything else they want to add? 
Uh, one other thing I was, I was just going to add, Tim, was uh, around the, the agendaless um, concept. Um, we've been, we work with a number of coaches, um, and some of the things that they come back with is around, you know, if, if should they be purely working to the client's agenda or not, or actually how strong do the, does the coach need to push against what the client wants to talk about, but actually what the organisation has said needs to be talked about in in the coaching environment. Now, I don't know whether where we're talking, we're just talking around kind of management coaching, and that might be good to just clarify before I say anything more. But are we talking about coaching in the formal sense or just coaching in a kind of management context? That's a really interesting point, and I think um, uh, this is a huge dilemma in internal coaching space uh, in terms of how involved they become or how not involved they become in terms of what the agenda is in the conversation. Now, reverting to my purist coaching um, background, I would say that the agenda is entirely focused on the coaching and can be nothing else. Having said that, I understand and know the difficulties that internal coaches face, and sometimes that can be almost impossible. Um, and you can be faced with a very difficult challenge of, of moving from the coaching into the mentoring or even the sort of consultative place. Um, a lot of it's about how you handle that phase transition rather than whether you actually do it or don't do it. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a dilemma. <laughs> well, it is difficult and I think um, the UCL did a really good study, which I think was it, they were at Sam, they were at your conference, mm -hmm. um, and he, he was talking about confidence, confidence in the coaching space and how um, whenever you look at a coach, if you measure the confidence of the coaching coach sheet or a coaching conversation, you often find the coaching confidence is always low. It starts off low and continues low because they're tackling their own personal issues. Um, but then you'll also find that um, a coach's confidence, if they're an internal coach, specifically, can also start low and remain low. Um, and that's deadly in terms of a successful coaching conversation. So, there's a lot in there about increasing coaching, internal coaches' confidence to make sure that they deliver good quality coaching. Um, and that, you know, there's a whole piece in there that I think may be missing for some people. You know, it's all very well training your guys up for ILM level five, EMCC, ITF coaching, but how much support and supervision are they getting in their ongoing coaching delivery within the organisation? That, I would say that's one thing that we have been measuring. We ensure that all our coaches have supervision at least every six months. And one of the questions we do ask is, you know, what difference does this make to how you feel about coaching and what you're going to apply to your practice? And it's incredible, like, the confidence boost that they get from being with a network of coaches, being able to learn a bit more and develop their skills, but also learn from the examples of others because we put them through group coaching. So they don't only get the you know, talk through their own kind of coaching topics or things that they want to, to talk through, but they get to learn about what other challenges people are um, are facing. And so they do a lot of learning all together. And, you know, it certainly makes a difference from what we've done. Yeah, absolutely. I think, for I me, mean, supervision, as Mr. said, is a critical part of the coaching culture and uh, true self-sustaining coaching culture. In fact, it's on one of our dimensions um, that we use to assess coaching culture. Um, and yes, it's, it's a must. Getting it right is the problem. Is most Well, I define anyone to actually understand exactly what coaching supervision looks and feels like, because um, everyone seems to have a different view. That's the matter for another webinar, though, coaching supervision. We'll get an expert in to talk about that. Okay, um, I, I, for me, I feel like we, we've come to, we've sort of exhausted all of uh, everything we've discussed. Um, I hope everyone's found something valuable out of that, really, an opportunity to discuss and talk through. There's some interesting stuff coming through here about, you know, that although we saw a number of definitions of coaching, what we felt was that the amazing conversations piece was, was strong. There was a piece in there about responsibility and blame free, and I'm intrigued to know whether that's just the public sector, and I suspect it isn't, actually. Um, but also support and challenge, which um, are not words that you would generally find in a coaching bible. However, they're key parts of a coaching culture, um, certainly the support piece. Um, and challenging, depending on how you challenge them, I think that can be directed appropriately as well. So has anybody got any last minute, um, anything they want to say? If not, then we can wrap it up. Sorry, Tim, for my benefit, I 
you've probably all got this on the screen because I, I can't see anything. I can't see any yeah. leaves or anything. It'd be really yeah. useful for me if I could just have a quick introduction as to where everybody else works. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let's. Well, each of you can do that because some people may not want to say, and I don't want to uh, okay. interrupt them. So, Carol, you're from Invest. Ian. I'm from uh, Nottingham City Homes. I'm owning a development manager and uh, coaching champion, which means I'm responsible for implementing it. I mean, it's interesting you just talked about supervision. We've just, just held our first group, uh, so supervision, which I run. And it's, it's group supervision, isn't it? How often is that held in? We're looking to do it every two months. Right, okay. Because the frequency and um, who should attend and what should be discussed are uh, a moot point in the supervision world. Yeah, that's all very clear and very clearly uh, yeah. laid out. And that is interesting. Uh, okay, Richard? Uh, so I'm Learning and Development Manager at a company called UTL, which is part of the Unipart Group. And uh, I am, yes, I am now responsible for uh, the continuing development of our uh, coaching culture, which we started about three years ago. Okay, Sam? Um, yeah, I work for West Midlands Employers uh, as a leadership and development consultant, and we work across 20 partner organisations um, running the West Midlands Coaching Pool. Um, so we've trained a number of coaches in all the organisations um, and kind of coordinate the, the coaching across those organisations. I think, Carol, you'll, you'll be familiar with um, coaching polls in the public sector. Um, and the West Midlands coaching poll is actually a very interesting, the arrangement they've got is, is very effective. Um, I know there's another one down in the South East that the council runs. Um, yeah, we're part of that. You're part of that one, okay. Well, um, so Sam runs the one up in the, uh, in the West Midlands. And the, the models are slightly different, actually. Um, however, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of interesting stuff going on there. Michaela hasn't come back saying that she would be happy to uh, tell us where she's from, but, uh, um, oh yes, so, uh, so yeah, Michaela there saying she works for Coface, um, which so are sorry? a, for Coface, they're a credit insurance company. Oh, thank you. That's all right. Um, we did have somebody who started with us but left us, and she can see if I can see whether the name, just for those of you that are interested, the other people in the name due to join us, Cognizant, we're a management development consultancy, they're a very large company uh, based out of India, um, read, uh, read the um, human capital, I hate that word, but the uh, consultants, um, British Gas and uh, Royal Bank of Scotland were also due to join us. Um, but for whatever reason, they didn't. Okay, uh, anybody got anything else to add? If not, we'll wrap it up. We've got seven minutes before we're sort of due to finish. Um, I hope you found that useful. And I will, what I will do is I'll um, get the slides out for those of you that attended. I will write up roughly what we said on just one side of A4. And I'm hoping this is the start of a longer discussion to try and define and determine what coaching cultures are to organisations so that we can start getting some sort of unified approach to it. I don't think that will truly ever happen, but, but if we can work towards it, I think there's some benefit in that. Okay, has anybody got anything else to add? No, that silence is, is always a good thing. Okay, well, thank you very much, folks. Uh, have a good day, have a lovely weekend. And um, we will um, hopefully catch up. There's a, uh, there is another one of these next month. And there's also a, a LinkedIn group called the Coaching Cultures Think Tank. If you sign up to that, I'll um, recommend you. It's only for people who are inside organizations responsible for developing coaching cultures. So just keep out the freelance if you can. Um, and uh, join that or get involved. And I'll send you an invite to the next um, webinar. If there's something you want to know or any questions about coaching cultures, then if we can't answer it, let's discuss it. If not, if I can answer it, then I'll send you through some information. All right, thank you very much. Lovely, thank, thank you, you very much. Take care, bye. Bye. Thanks, bye.